Welcome to this section on using serverless microservices at scale and in production. So even before you consider using serverless in a production environment, you need to consider whether it is suitable to use serverless computing at all. There are some specific use cases we will discuss where that's not the case and alternatives are just better suited for that type of use case. It's also important to consider any running costs in the equation. Then once you are ready to or have already deployed your serverless stack in production, there are many considerations that you need to look at as well as optimizations that you can do to ensure that your serverless stack is running efficiently and as cheaply as possible. In this section, we are going to take a look at when you should use serverless computing and when you should seek alternatives. Then we will talk about estimating the serverless stack costs. Then talk about different scalability approaches for databases and event streaming. And then we'll talk about how our landers and other items in the serverless stack can be optimized in order to reach web scale performance and availability. Finally, we're going to conclude the course and we'll provide a quick overview on what we covered. Welcome to this video on when to use and not to use serverless computing. Let's review some of the key differences and the factors that you should consider when making your decision. In this video, we are going to take a look at why non-functional requirements are important, when you should find alternatives to serverless microservices and AWS Lambda, then we'll talk about when to use serverless microservices and AWS Lambda, and look at different options available for functions as a service. And finally, we'll take a look at customer managed versus cloud managed stacks and modern open source software that can be hosted in different ways. So I found that a good independent way to decide if serverless is right for your organization without getting too political and defensive is to look at your non-functional requirements. So I'm not going to go into depth on what non-functional requirements are, but let's discuss the relevant ones when considering a serverless stack. So just as a quick reminder, functional requirements define what a system is supposed to do, and non-functional requirements define how a system is supposed to be, such as throughput, durability, and availability. I think it's really important to know your existing and future non-functional requirements to work out the cost and determine if you can use serverless or not, or even part serverless architecture in your final solution. It's difficult and much more complex to estimate costs of a serverless stack as they are based on pay-as-you-go usage. But if you can work out the number of concurrent requests or number of average requests, and the different payload sizes and length of requests that will put you on a good path to actually estimating the costs. Also knowing the service level agreements for the API requirements is useful as the quality, availability, responsibilities between your services and clients are important and will help you define your requirements or non-functional requirements. As we discussed earlier, Think about the CAP theorem. Do we need always up-to-date consistency or having a few seconds or tens of seconds old data and serving that back to the user? Is that really that important? So this will obviously impact your architecture and also your cost. Finally, if everything goes wrong or part of the services or network fails, what do you do to recover? What will happen to the existing users, for example, accessing the systems or the user data. Usually what you do is look at disaster recovery. So if you want full disaster recovery or DR, then you need to think about these scenarios, which would also impact your design decisions, architecture and overall costs. So if you're not sure of any of these, 
check the logs, look at the monitoring you already have in place and estimate them based on that. And also speak with any of the key stakeholders in the administrative space, the DBAs and the DevOps team if you have one. Although this course is about serverless, as with everything I do, I think it's important to provide a balanced view. Let's have a look at when serverless microservices and AWS Lambda are not suitable and what alternatives are available. If your organization is already using containers and only open source software is allowed, then AWS Lambda and some of the AWS services will not be suitable. If your non-functional requirements are to have a very low latency with strong consistency of maybe less than 50 milliseconds, excluding any caching, or if there's a very large number of requests per second, for example, maybe more than 3,000 concurrent requests per second, and again, without having any ability to cache the data, then I'd say using a serverless stack will be slower and probably cost you more than having an always on fleet. It can also get expensive, especially for the API gateway and microservices combination, where you expect one lander spun up per request. So if you think about, for example, a large trained machine learning model that's scored online via an API in real time, this could be that sort of case. However, in the serverless streaming use cases, this is less of an issue with a backend service such as Kinesis Streams to Lambda. It's all async, micro batched, and generally I'll say it's cheaper than using a fleet of containers or EC2 instances. If you have a large code deployments, so Lambda currently has a limit of 250 megabytes on the code and dependencies as a package before any compression is done, and also deployment of 50 megabytes compressed as a zip, which is relatively small, especially for Java. There's also limits on disk space. So you've got 500 megabytes limit on local storage. So the same goes for when you have a large API request with a big payload. The maximum is six megabyte request or response payload size in API Gateway. In addition, if you need to keep complex state in an application, then landers are not suitable unless you maybe use the step functions we discussed earlier. But generally, it's a very bad idea to maintain state within a service or application, and it makes it more complex to scale out and recover from crashes. But you might have a use case such as a security use case or an online ML model, for example, where you need to do so. If you need to maintain a connection open for longer than a few minutes, then a lambda is probably not ideal. The use case that I've seen is when you want to run a complex query on Amazon Cloud Data Warehouse called Redshift, and it takes several hours to run, and you want to keep the connection open until it completes. In those cases, you should consider other solutions, I'd say. If you need fixed costs, then alternatives might be better as services pay as you go, as you know, so the costs are dependent on usage. We'll explore that in the next section. If you want to avoid AWS tie-in and host your own open source alternatives, then have a look at having your DevOps team host and manage your own infrastructure. That makes more sense. In this case, if you have your DevOps team, I would look at using Docker containers managed by Kubernetes, or better, look at using the managed version of them, which are recently released AWS Fargate or about to be released the Amazon EKS. So you should consider using a serverless microservice stack if your API based latency is greater than 50 milliseconds or your batch processing is less than five minutes, such as with Kinesis Stream event sources or DynamoDB streams. If you only need to support weak consistency, API Gateway and Dynamo caching are a great option. If you need a quick deployment with high availability and you have limited DevOps experience in-house, where you can very quickly deploy a full stack, highly available, resilient and monitoring in place, then you can use everything we talked about in this course and this is a good way to do it. So if you want to focus on the core business logic only, 
which happens because you have the event sources, which are built in, managed by AWS, and the IAM roles, which are used for securing access to any of the AWS resources, then again, service is a good way to go. In addition, you probably have variable traffic and number of requests. So again, the pay as you go model makes sense as you only pay for usage and there's no fleet to scale up or scale down. And finally, if you already mostly have AWS already running, then it makes sense to stick with AWS Lambda in at least, I'd say, some of your infrastructure. It makes sense given the low barrier of entry and simplicity to actually deploy a serverless stack. So what about the alternatives to AWS Lambda? Let's have a quick look at the pros and cons of open source versus closed source functions as a service. First, let's look at the non-cloud provider functions or fully open source ones such as Kubeless, Apache OpenWhisk, which is both open and also managed by IBM, and Fission. So I wouldn't really classify them as open source functions as serverless, as they're generally based around Kubernetes and Docker containers. The great advantages of these are that there's no tie-in to one cloud provider, which means you can use them in multiple clouds in theory, and even better, run them in your own data center and have full control on them. The drawbacks are that most of these functions do not have the built-in mechanisms, such as the event sources like we saw with Kinesis Streams, API Gateway, Dynamo, CloudWatch, which means additional development effort. Then the functions are not serverless, as you still need to manage the containers, even if Kubernetes or Amazon EKS can help. I'd say there's still a lack of maturity on the contenders at the moment, and there's no clear winner. If you think about it, do you want to be left on a deprecated and feature limited open source function if you choose the wrong one? Will your developers continue to contribute to the open source project? So those are questions that you need to ask, I'd say. As an alternative, all cloud providers almost have or functions as a service at the moment. So you've got AWS Lambda, Azure Function, Google Functions and IBM OpenWhisk. The advantages are that it is built in event source and very well integrated with the rest of the cloud provider service. So that includes the security, the infrastructure as we saw earlier. And of course, the only thing that you need to configure for AWS was the IAM policies and roles really for the security side. AWS Lambda is the most mature and stable function as a service. First came out in 2014. It's got the widest adoption and in recent surveys of the state of the developer nation, Q4 2017, there's already 44% of the developers who claim they used AWS Lambda already with a much higher satisfaction and NPS score than other cloud providers. If you search Google Trends, you'll see the same. Everybody's using AWS Lambda over other providers. The downside are that you are tied to one cloud provider, which essentially makes it more difficult to move your infrastructure. The function orchestration and code is closed source. So for example, you have limits like the code package and sizes we discussed earlier. It can also be harder to predict the cost as it's pay as you go. Okay, let's go for a broader look at customer managed versus cloud managed stacks which is a choice you will face. I'll give you some examples on how open source fits in, in my view. So there's three types of ways to host your infrastructure in the cloud. The first is to host your own open source software and services yourself. This could be in uh, EC2 instances or containers. Then you can use open source solutions hosted either by the vendor rather than by yourself or closed proprietary source managed by the service provider. The difference between hosted by vendor or cloud provider is usually that the vendor is open source contributor, which means that any features are available a lot earlier and sometimes they're much more advanced. But if you use managed services by a cloud provider, they will usually be much better integrated with the rest of the cloud stack, effectively saving you time on integration and deployments, for example.
Okay, let's have a look at some actual examples. So this just shows you, you need to self-host your own services in cloud. So we could host our own Logstash, Elasticsearch and Kibana ourselves with our in-house DevOps team or pay Elastic to manage it for us. Or alternatively, we could use Amazon CloudWatch. For functions of the service, we could use Kubeless or have our own DevOps team manage the Kubernetes cluster, use the open source version like OpenWhisk and have IBM manage it for us, or we could use AWS Lambda. Using Lambda means that you benefit from the built-in integration and security, whereas using the others, you'll have to do some additional work. For databases, you could install and manage MySQL in-house if you have DBAs available to back up and upgrade it, or use RDS MySQL well, all this is done for you by AWS, or you could use a compatible version, which is Aurora RDS or Aurora Serverless. All that management is done by AWS and the optimizations and performance are built in compared to the raw MySQL. For object storage, the most widespread standard is S3. So even those who only want to use open source software, that's still the case. The reason is that it is pay-as-you-go based on volumes and traffic and is cheap. After all, why do you think Dropbox and Netflix use S3? Because it's cheap, highly available and highly durable and focus essentially on the product and the content. So if you want, you can actually host your own open source object storage server with the likes of Mini.io. I wouldn't be sure why you would want to do that, I'd say. Mini.io is compatible with Amazon S3 cloud storage service. However, the downside, as with other open source, is that, of course, you need to run your own cluster. If you do at the moment, I'd say, given S3 is highly available and durable at 99.9 .9 with nine S's percent durability, you would need a pretty large cluster across multiple regions in order to replicate that durability. So finally, for streaming data, I would say that Kafka is probably one of the more feature complete versions and that Kinesis is slightly behind, but it does work out much more expensive, especially if you host it yourself or use a cloud vendor like Confluent, for example. The lowest cost they offer is $500 a month for Confluent versus $50 a month for Kinesis streams. Remember that it's not all or nothing, and you can mix between the two. However, I found that where it makes sense to stick with AWS Stack is the integration and security benefits and the time to market to get your product out into production. It's also about which services really you want to provide your business. What's the business differentiator against the competition? Is logging and managing a database really a competitive differentiator? Is it better to get the product out quicker and do less management? Or is it better to do everything in-house to keep it all in one place? Those are the questions to ask.